And I think you need more than just being your champion's friend to be a really effective CSM. You have to challenge them on things. You have to be comfortable with telling them they're wrong about something, but doing so in a really effective way that, again, positions them towards a better solution and ultimately growth. Greetings, lifers, and thank you for joining us. You're listening to Lifetime Value, the customer success podcast, where we help you wrap up the week that was in customer success and start you off on the right foot for the one ahead of you. I am your host, the Lance Allen of Customer Success Podcasts. My name is Dylan Young, and this week's guest is a former athlete, a working mom, a self-proclaimed big old nerd, and the lead (laughs) customer success manager at DocuSign. Ladies and gentlemen, Please welcome Brittany Casey. Thank you. Great to be here, Dylan. Thanks. Brittany, did I pronounce your last name correctly? You did. Yeah. It's a trick question. It's a very difficult one. (laughs) I have had a string (laughs) of folks with very difficult last names. And so Mm -hmm. I just, I think it's just a habit now. And it's a, it's a good one. The name is important. Yeah. I don't have I don't have problems with pronunciation. What I get more after I got married and now having two first names for mm. my first and last name is I get called Casey a lot in emails, which it's fine. I'll answer to that too. Whatever you want. <laughs> Do you have other Britneys at DocuSign that you work closely with that you have to like differentiate between? Not really. This was a problem growing up for me. I was actually on a volleyball team with ten girls that had three Britneys. And I was the tallest, so they tried to call me Big Brittany, and I did not like it. <laughs> <laughs> well, luckily, as Big Brittany, you had the muscle to <laughs> slap that down. That's exactly right. Yeah, yeah I was I was captain, and it, it got changed to Tall Brittany. So that's what I, I, I assumed it would be. Big Brittany <laughs> seems pointedly chosen. Sounds like Big Bird to me. That's what that's what I think of immediately. <laughs> okay, so I have to ask you, do you understand the reference to this is kind of a generic name, Lance Allen? The Lance Allen of Customer Success Podcast? No. Nope. Okay. <laughs> How about if I give you a hint? His title okay. is the Senior Merchant of Decorative Holiday Items. Oh my gosh. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. Yeah, yes, yes. I can't believe I got that wrong. Oh my god. Who is he? I'm he he's the creator of the 12 foot skeleton. So I could not actually find out if he was truly the creator, but he ran the he team he that invented Skelly. Yes, that's can correct. You, um <laughs> Can you tell everybody why Skelly is holds a special place in your heart? Yes, um, I am a crazy Halloween decorator, and I own a 12-foot skelly. His, mine's name is Biggie Smalls, um, because I used to say, you're killing me, Smalls, for the two years it took me to actually acquire the 12-foot sm- really? skeleton, because it's that difficult. Yes, yeah, Lance Allen is is the king of Halloween over there at Home Depot, and yeah. we are very grateful for all he's he's put into the community these days. He also he released the werewolf last year, um, and the witch <laughs> and that. the phantom. Whoa! And this year, the I, I shouldn't be sharing this. This is this is top secret. But uh, <laughs> the rumor is it's a at least a ten foot zombie coming out this year from Home Depot. So we'll just have to see what actually transpires. Do you own any of the others, or is it just the skeleton? <sighs> Here's the deal. We saw the werewolf in store last year and my two kids, three and a half now and one and a half are usually really into Halloween. They have to be in my house. But when we went to Home Depot and actually saw the werewolf and his head moves back and he howls and growls and all Uh of that, Uh they did not like it. (laughs) So um, I was on the fence. There was one for half price at our local Home Depot right before Halloween. We always do one last run there because everything gets marked down really low. I asked my three-year-old if he wanted the werewolf and he said, no. 
So, <laughs> um, so we ended up not getting him. I have a great spot for him. I wanted to put him in the backyard, but we didn't end up getting him. And that, I don't want to have a ton of huge creatures all across my yard. Yeah. I really love the skeleton. I think he's the OG and I want the focus to remain on him in my display. So we'll stick, we'll stick with Biggie Smalls for now. And you volunteer with is it St. Jude's in relation to your giant skeleton? Yes, that's correct. So I'm the coordinator for our neighborhood for um, Skeletons for St. Jude's, which is now the second largest fringe fundraiser for St. Jude's since it started. I, I don't want to downplay any fundraisers I'm not aware of, but I know we have killed our goals for the plat past couple of years. And it's not just about people that have the 12-foot skeleton. It is also anybody really that wants to decorate for Halloween and mm. believes in the whole idea that, you know, we are doing this for the kids that can't be out there and see all the cool Halloween decorations. We killed our goal of 200K last year across the country, and we are... I believe doubling that for next year. So um, it's a great Whoa. organization to be a part of. And it really is giving back to kids who are, who are battling cancer because cancer sucks and we want to do all we can. How big is your neighborhood that you brought? In? 200 grand? <laughs> no, 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 not, not my neighborhood oh, nationwide. Okay. okay. Got it. Got it. <laughs> We did wow. have nine houses participate this year. So we are one of the largest, as far as state by state goes, as far as individual participants in yeah. a specific area, we're, we're up there for Virginia. So we're representing. Yeah. It's <laughs> pretty cool. Um, Thank you. Let's get back on topic here. <laughs> sure. Lead <laughs> customer success manager at DocuSign. And that's a relatively new position for you. Is that right? That's correct. So we kind of realigned our titles here to better reflect what we do. Um, this title typically refers to CSMs at our org that are dealing with really marquee enterprise customers, mm. business drivers for our company, and um, highly strategic deals um, with the DocuSign platform. So it's not just eSign. We're talking about contract lifecycle management and the other tools. It's all about an end-to-end -end agreement process. And the CSMs that have this title are typically hand handling that process at a really strategic level. How did you find customer success originally? Oh, I started in sales, actually, not surprisingly. <laughs> I'm a used car salesman. Um, <laughs> no, but I started in sales and I had an opportunity to go after a, a sales engineering role. And I was thinking to myself, you know, I want to be the unicorn salesperson. I want to be the salesperson that has the tech background that can go in and handle those objection questions just as well as an ESE can. Um, and that's going to help me succeed in this space. Um, when I got that SE job, that company, a contracts analytics company, was developing their customer success group. And they talked to me about moving over to that, which was exciting to me because when I really looked back at what I enjoy about the sales process, it's not closing huge quotas. I, I, I was frequently on leaderboards and I really honestly couldn't find any balance when I was a salesperson because I always had to win. Um, but the part I really enjoyed was the customer relationship after the deal got closed. And I thought the real sale was in the renewal because this was back before we had renewal managers and CSMs and everybody that handles yeah. that post-contract relationship. And that was the part I loved because that told me that like I did right by the customer by selling this in the first place. We solved a business problem and we're here to stay. So that was more gratifying for me than the initial sales process. Um, so when I realized that customer success is very much tied to proving out that value, it was the perfect place for me. I never looked back. Love customer success. You don't hear that nearly as often as, as I would expect. Salesperson turned CSM. Uh, and I know that we're going to talk more about that in a second. But you have a very interesting background. Do you want to talk a little bit about this? And there's a lot here. So maybe you hit on the parts <laughs> that you think are maybe in, inform you on a day-to-day -day basis what you do now at, at DocuSign and professionally. Sure. I, I mean, I, I would say all these very different things that I've done throughout my life have definitely contributed to who I am as a CSM today. 
I was an athlete since I could walk. And the way I was able to be an athlete is I had to be really good at fundraisers because we couldn't afford to go to all the out of state tournaments Mm. and everything. So I had to be really good at fundraisers if I wanted to keep playing at elite levels. So really, I've been in sales a long time. (laughs) I got out of college and in college, I really thought I was going to be a lawyer. Um, I was a poli sci major and I, I just... Um, I really wanted to play volleyball at Pepperdine, didn't end up doing that. So I was like, all right, well, I can go to grad school at law school, Pepperdine, right? That's great too. And I realized when I got out of college that I didn't want to take on the debt that would be associated with going Mm. to any law school, let alone Pepperdine. And I became a personal trainer because there was a need in my area for elite athletes to understand how to train for the next level, for the D1, D2, um, NCAA college levels. And I did pretty well right off the bat. I had connections to a lot of key coaches and was training kids that were going out for football and that kind of thing, because I was very familiar with how to condition at that level, because we often condition with the baseball team or the football team or basketball Mm -hmm. or whatever it was. I tried to translate that to Colorado. I moved back to my home state. And I think, honestly, it was a little ahead of its time. These days, you see eight-year-olds out there like lifting weights and having their own Instagram, trying to get sponsorships already for for those scholarships. And Mm -hmm. maybe it's not going to be about scholarships so much with how how that's changed um, with them being able to be endorsed now. It was a little ahead of its time. And so I had a friend that worked at a tech company in Denver that said, hey, you you should try this. And I did business development for a couple months and then quickly moved into an outside sales role where I covered Wyoming, Montana, and Northern Colorado. It was for a digital signage company. And I I learned a lot. I, I think starting as a BD, you really learn discipline. From there, you kind of you can kind of expand on that. But I think I think the most effective salespeople have had the experience of smiling and dialing and just having to pick up the phone and make mm. that cold call. I think the other area of your my, my background you're alluding to is uh, one thing that I also did coming out of college was I started getting into bodybuilding. Mm. It was pretty new at the time, around 2010, 2011. The bikini division and the MPC had just been established, and it basically meant you didn't have to be super, super buff to compete. It was about real women's bodies. I'd never had a lot of confidence before. I'd never, in my weight and walking, I'd never wore heels, anything. By the way, I'm six foot tall, so that's why I didn't wear heels. (laughs) This gave me a lot of confidence. I lost a lot of weight for my first show as I was a personal trainer. I felt like I had to look the part, too. And in Oklahoma, bodybuilding translated into modeling, translated into pageants because we are so close to Texas. So I actually competed on the Miss USA system for a little bit too. And I think what was key there was I learned confidence. I learned how to walk into a room and own it. I learned how to talk to anybody without being scared of them. Mm. And that has really served me well in later years and really just having that executive presence that's necessary to be a CSM and be an effective customer advisor. What a wild ride. (laughs) It's so cool (laughs) though. Cause like you can almost, you can almost like feel how each one of those things can contribute to what you do as a CSM. And absolutely the through line that I recognized is, man, the the challenges that you put upon yourself, you are about challenging yourself and taking it to the next level. You know, you may not have been confident, but you sounded like you were very self-aware in what it is that you needed to work on and and, um, I assume continue to be. I, I hope to be. I think there's always room to improve in whatever you're doing. For me right now, I'm really focused on learning from some some of the best leaders at my company and therefore translating into being a much more effective leader the next time I am in a late leadership role. Always be learning is is one thing that always comes up. I know it's always be selling normally with uh, yep. with sales, but I think it's more always be learning and that's learning from your customer, learning from your colleagues, learning from your leadership and learning from your mistakes. And that's kind of how I got on the path I was on and where I am today because of it. Brittany, do you want to jump into some of the current event topics from the past week? Absolutely. So 
One thing that's really close to my heart and something that I'm working on really closely at my org right now is aligning sales and customer success. It's critical if you want to grow an account to be in line with the sales organization, whether they are in charge of that number or not. You kind of need to be synced up on your strategy. And sales may not always mean sales specifically. It could mean renewals. It could mean um, the business development group, whatever it is. But we'll get into cross-functional in a minute. But uh, sales and customer success is key for growth at accounts. You you touched on it a little bit, and this is my main question, is I, I feel like we have to do a little bit more definition in order to understand how this applies, because not every organization, sales is not an owner or part owner of any post-sale motion in every organization. And so you mm-hmm. mentioned renewals, and so tell me what that means to you. Like, what are you actually envisioning when you say, these two departments have to be aligned for expansion and retention of a customer. I think immediately what comes to mind is communication. Um, I have really, really transparent relationships with every AE I've ever worked with and renewal manager and whatever account manager, whatever it might be. And maybe we over communicate. I would even (laughs) say that, but, but we use every channel available to us because It's not always true that we have access to all the same systems to see all the different things about a customer. For instance, I love Slack. I I create a team channel for every one of my customers and I use it very frequently. I think it's the best practice to have some kind of open communication and kind. we kind of use it to report on, here's what's happening in this account today. A regular cadence with your salespeople seems like a given to me, but I, I realize that's not always the case. I think if you are responsible for any level of growth at an account, usually sales is going to want to be coordinated with you because it kind of depends on the organization. Where I am now, they do have a number tied to growth as well. So as long as we're aligned on those on on the strategy around growth and we're getting the customer what they need, I think it's really critical to be aligned to sales because if you don't, Sales may not always have that insight to diagnose and prescribe the right solution to grow Mm -hmm. with. And especially with larger, complex organizations where each of you might have different relationships, it's really going to behoove both parties to utilize the bonds that we've already created to kind of grow on that. So all that to say, I like to be in sync strategy wise with sales. And I like to keep it very clear, crystal clear, open communication about what's going on in each department. I don't want to hear about a BD contacting somebody in a department that I didn't know was going to happen. I'm not saying don't do that, but let's let's keep the account team account team in on that. And let's talk to the CSM. Maybe they know an area of the business that really could benefit from an expansion deal. Let's use that to target this BD effort. So couple of questions for you. First of all, mm-hmm. super tactical. Who is in your Slack channel for each account? You, the AE, who else? Um, any professional services that we have aligned with the account. Um, right now we have a renewals function where I work. So that person for sure. And then I include the leadership of all those people too. I work with really highly visible accounts and I feel like the leaders need to be involved and know what's going on with each of those things. Um, I also really like to have the sales engineer, the solutions consultant looped in because they are really strong resource. Like I can demo the product. It's great. But I love bringing an SE in that's just phenomenal with demo demoing to really close on a, on a product that makes sense for my customer. Does that get noisy? Not all of mine do. I don't think they get used enough sometimes. Maybe I'm the noisy one <laughs> <laughs> to other people. <laughs> when you're at these highly strategic accounts, it needs to be noisy. You need Mm. to be constantly communicating and constantly adjusting. If you have a customer that appears in the news and something changes with their financials or their quarterly report came out and there's really something important in there that's different than the business objectives we already had aligned, I want the whole team to know about that. And one I didn't mention that I should have is our support contact is definitely in there too, because we have dedicated support resources for our our marquee customers. It, I think part of the role of the CSM is when you do need to escalate, that is a place where you can step in and really 
make sure that the customer gets what they need too. So support, sales, renewals if you have it, BD even, and leadership. I am a little bit allergic to Slack because I think it's too... Um, <laughs> and I, No, I, I, and I'm not trying to poo-poo your idea, but I think Slack is a little too uh, loosey-goosey. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's, very, it's very um, AOL instant messenger to me. Mm-hmm. When I have stuff that I need to be sure gets acted upon, I still always default to email. Do you have folks okay. from your from your organization who are pushing email as the preferred channel versus Slack? Or like, how would you deal with trying to uh, build consensus around the way in which you talk about a customer and through which channels? It's a great question. Uh, I think it's a fair question to ask an account team the second that you're assigned to a new customer. What's your preferred me- method of communication? It doesn't have to be Slack every time. And I've I've been at companies where Slack is very dysfunctional. That's not the case for me these days, but I, I have certainly <laughs> seen that before. Um, I think what's great yes. about yeah, <laughs> uh, I think what's great about the email that you mentioned is that there's a paper trail. So yep. if there's something that needs to get done, there is usually an email associated with it as well. Um, so we can see the progress on that. Or if you're following cases in your CRM, whatever it might be, you know, there are a lot of different channels that we have available to us. But it's important to all agree kind of upon one that's going to drive action more than others. And I think you're right. I think that depends very much on how each of the, those mediums are used. So I think sales is is probably one of our most critical partners with with customer mm-hmm. success. But you did mention that this is this could just kind of roll up to an overall conversation around cross-functional collaboration, of which... I do believe communication is is just absolutely paramount. But mm-hmm. if we're zooming out, what other departments do you think we need to partner with at the same level we do as sales? For me, that what I've seen mo- most recently be really effective is really strong ties to product, mm-hmm. especially if you have a customer that's going to influence your product. You want to be able to get that messaging to the people who are making the changes as soon as possible. And isn't it good for a customer to tell you what works and what doesn't about your product and have that be part of your product strategy? So having some good ties there. And for us, we even introduce our customer directly to product owners when a new product is coming out or has come out that would really apply or help their business. Um, I think that's a really key area. The next would be, and I don't always see this, but I really think it's important to stay in line with professional services, whether they are permanent to an account or temporary. I think it's very important to be in line with any projects that are happening, maybe a new implementation of a new solution, but you need to have some degree of separation as well, because ultimately you're overseeing the larger customer relationship and you shouldn't be so tied to the the day-to-day of that project. You need to be in the know of it and you need to be coordinated with the PM that's running the project to make sure the customer is getting what they need, um, not just for the project itself, but for the larger larger customer journey. But I think communication, again, is key there. It's it's all about having a sync strategy and and communicating that in an effective way to anybody that's going to be touching the customer in any capacity. A bit of a tangent. You mentioned introducing product or having product be involved and mm-hmm. working very closely with product, particularly with customers that may influence the roadmap of the product. And I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but DocuSign mm-hmm. is huge. Do you actually have customers that are influencing the roadmap in a significant way, or are they just one of many that submit feature enhancement ideas What does that look like at DocuSign? With any large organization, there's agreements associated with it, with confidentiality and that kind of thing. When we're looking at testing beta of Mm. some product or another, that kind of thing. But I would say that our business driver customers absolutely have influence in the direction our product goes because we're looking to solve problems for people. And these are our people that we've worked with for years. I think customer feedback is so important to the direction of a product that I think we really do take that seriously at DocuSign or really customer first in that sense, as far as the roadmap goes. 
How about the ever-present uh, voice of Catalyst Software on LinkedIn, our good friend Kevin Chu, and his very saucy post that he put out probably middle of this week. It's a long one, as most of his are. But it <laughs> the headline is, here's why sales gets paid more than customer success. And some of the items on it are customer success, essentially like logging activities in their CSP just to get credit for it, failing to forecast in an effective way, answering support emails that should be automated or dealt with by a separate team. Okay. So those are the things that CSMs are doing and shouldn't be doing. And the things that mm -hmm. CSMs should be doing, but are not knowing how to multi-thread executive sponsor management not having happy ears, strategic white space mapping, driving value daily through a multi-channel orchestration. I've, I've got some stuff here at the end that I want to call out. But first of all, I want to get your opinion on this, this post. High level, do you agree? High level, absolutely. I agree 100%, 98%. There was one part that I was like, hmm, I've never thought of that before. Maybe I should try it. But um I classify myself as a growth-minded CSM because of my sales background. So I am always thinking bigger strategy. How do we grow this account in a way that's right for the customer that continues to solve their problems, but at a, at a higher level? Right off the bat, a couple things that stood out to me. Multi-threaded approach, that's pretty obvious, right? Like you need... You can never be in a situation where your your champion leaves and then suddenly the account is at risk because of it. You really need to have an executive sponsor attached to it. And even if an account is extremely healthy with a great champion, if you don't have threads elsewhere to other areas of the business, especially at the executive level, you should consider that account at risk. White spacing. I love that he pointed this out because this is a great place for a CSM to start really collaborating with sales. As a CSM, you should know the customer's business almost better than they do. And again, let's let's be clear. I'm talking about a very high-touch CSM model where you have a lot of time to dedicate to being a customer advocate, probably a smaller book. We're not talking scaled customer success in this situation. Mm -hmm. You have a lot to bring to the table as far as where else can we solve business problems for the customer? Sales needs to know that. Like they really need to know that in, in how they're going out with their business development reps, how the marketing is targeted at specific needs within the company and sitting down and actually putting down on paper where the white space, where the opportunity is, is huge. It also will help you define where it isn't because there are areas of the business that maybe your solution can't solve something for, even though on paper, it might look like a great area. You as the CSM know better because you have the relationship with the champion. You, you're, you're taking health scores. You, you hear things about the business that I think sales does it because you have that customer advisor relationship. And then the part that really stood out to me on his post, because honestly, it's very personal. I talked about how I wanted to be an SE so I could be a unicorn salesperson. I decided I wanted to be an SE after reading a book called The Challenger Sale mm. by Matt Dixon. And basically, it talks about five different types of salespeople. And after I read that, I identified myself as the relationship builder, which unfortunately, <laughs> that is the lowest of the top performers. Only 7% of top performers are relationship builders. And I was like, oh, am I not uh -oh. doing the right job? Yeah. <laughs> Um, but what I love about customer success is that you can pay, play multiple roles. Yeah. I was, I, I did a lot of acting as a kid. Maybe that's why I was drawn to that aspect of it. But I love the idea that a lot of these other types of salespeople were, it's just kind of a personality trait. It's how you are. But with the challenger, you can teach somebody to be a challenger. And I think you need more than just being your champion's friend to be a really effective CSM. You have to challenge them on things. You have to be comfortable with telling them they're wrong about something, but doing so in a really effective way. 
that, again, positions them towards a better solution and ultimately growth. I love that he called out the challenger. My comment on on the post was that I think the challenger sales should be required reading for Mm. every new CSM. And then the one, when I say 98%, because I hadn't thought of ever doing this, was the piece about being part of the pipeline conversation. That is something I've never done since I've been in sales. That's a part of sales I hated. <laughs> I hated pipeline conversations so much. Why? I hated projections. I just, I wanted to get it right every time. And there's a bit of nuance that goes into it. There's a bit of BS sometimes that goes mm-hmm. into numbers. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't like it. I like I like data that I can tell a story with and being forward thinking. I need to get better at that. So that's an interesting approach. It's something I'm willing to try to look at because mm-hmm. it kind of makes sense, right? If you're talking about the larger growth of of a region or whatever it might be, the pipeline conversation might actually be really important to that. So it's not something I've done. That's the one that stood out as hmm, that's that's different, but something I'd be willing to try. He in that same bullet point it reads, create pipeline. Customer revenue is your biggest asset and easiest lead gen source, which I'm not sure I understand that. They own the CSQL process and is meticulously tracked through your CSP plus CRM. Own a number or be a number. In this case, number is an expense in financial plan. So we have to take a step back here and and who is responsible for closing a deal pre or, I mean, we know pre-sales, it's sales. Post sales, mm-hmm. is it also sales? At DocuSign, I'm asking, do you guys practice the CSQL framework where customer success unearths opportunities and then hands them off to sales? I mean, you might stay with it, but it is largely a sales effort pre or post for achieving additional revenue. Is that the way you guys do it at DocuSign? We're a fairly large company. We have a mm-hmm. lot of different teams and resources that go into the renewal process and any expansion deals or upsells. Yes, sales is involved with getting those closed because they have a retention number as well. Um, and so do we as CSMs. So yes, I think that if that's the model you're going for, where you want sales to be a part of those conversations after the initial contract is signed, which i personally think is best. That means that sales will have to set the customer up in a, in a contract and with a product and with a solution that makes sense from the start, that we kind of have a larger view of how can we grow this? How can we scale this from the start? And if we don't have that continuity from one contract to another, that can get really segmented. We can start doing a la carte solutions that don't make mm-hmm. sense in the long term, that maybe they should have been in a skew that has a lot more features because they're growing so fast. And and if you're not all kind of compensated similarly in that respect, mm-hmm. um, it's going to be really difficult to have those really continuous conversations. The comment or bullet point within this post that got me is both in the positive and the negative. In the thumbs down, the last thumbs down bullet point, it is log into a CSP's docs feature to mention your customers that never reply because they are drowning in their own work. And the flip side of that is don't pretend customers log into your shared spreadsheet to check tasks and pretend that was valuable. And so there is a uh, rival CSP that their feature for this is literally called docs. And so I couldn't help but chuckle that... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> this is this all feels a little bit like an embedded sales uh, tactic on Kevin's part, which, hey, look, he's the owner of the business. He has to do it. He's a founder. Got to do what you got to do. <laughs> he is out here just tearing these other guys down. That was the, the thing that I thought was funny about that. But I agree. Yeah, <laughs> I think there's a there's a really important caveat to apply to Kevin's post. It is that everything he's talking about is very, very strategic. Mm -hmm. Like if you are a digital CSM, scaled CSM, whatever you want to call it, you got a a lot of customers. Your ability to white space map for each account is going to be limited. Now, are there maybe scalable ways to do that? Some level of data analysis averaged across your customers to understand where additional opportunities might be. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But this idea of like multiple 
uh, executive sponsors and champions. And that's not always possible no. when you're on the long tail side of your company's customer list. Correct. What I find interesting is he, uh, he, in a comment, there was a woman who said something like, I, this does not apply to my organization in her, she had something, a title of like enterprise project creator, executive whisperer. Like it was something bizarre that <laughs> doesn't exist in any other company. And his argument sure. was, it was actually the opposite of what I'm saying, which I find confusing. It was, you have a very one-off outlier sort of role. Uh, so of course, mm -hmm. not all of these things apply to you, but there's a lot of SMB CSMs out here who should learn this stuff. To me, I think that is patently false. And I think once you start to learn these skills, you are no longer an SMB CSM, at least the way we've designed the customer success role today. Now, do I believe that an SMB CSM should have a lower skill set? Should that be a junior role? Maybe not, but then we've got to change a lot of our cost structures internally. So mm -hmm. if it's not a junior role, they got to get paid more. And then you've got to give them more customers in order for them to make economic sense for right. you as a company and as a CSM managing customers. So I don't know what the answer is there, but there's there are a few gaps here about what he's saying that I think are just the information is overall good and in general good. Just pay attention, folks, that it is very specific to a very strategic role that he's talking 100%. about. hundred percent. Yes. Yeah, I would agree with that. Like you said, the strategy jumped out at me as well. Um, I think really what he's trying to say in the first part of the no-nos, what you shouldn't be doing is going through the motions, which is the opposite yeah. of strategy, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's checking a box and that benefits nobody, not even yourself. I have a hard time with that. I, I, I'm sure I've done it in my mm. in my past to get things done, especially the things that I'm not great at. But you're selling yourself so short if you're going through the motions and you're in one of these strategic roles where you have the ability to grow an account and make these relationships and network and and think about things on a really highly strategic level. You're going to learn so much from that. So. If you have the ability to take the time and be able to have these strategic conversations, a deep white spacing session with your AE, take it, take that opportunity. It's great to learn how sales, the sales process works and how your specific account executive that you're working with, how they think about these deals, because that's probably going to come into play during a renewal or a new account that you might have with that AE again. So great to learn. For sure. For sure. I agree. Okay, so we've got a segment where we give you an opportunity to tell us the story about the one customer that you wish you could fire or you did fire, <laughs> though I, I rarely hear that story. And that's called Churn It Up. Tell us your customer from hell. I have a bit of a nuanced answer to this, and I want to tell you why. So this is my least favorite kind of customer. It's the customer that has been oversold on the product mm. that you get and they have all these expectations or they purchased way too many features and will not be utilizing those and you still have to try to justify some healthy KPIs in that sense. You can push a business as far as you can, but ultimately the business is going to determine their objectives and you need to align your solution to help them solve for those. So even if it's you identifying that a business has a specific goal and that your your solution can help them accomplish that and relaying that back to your champion it's the business that decides it so i've had instances where just just feature overload and they're overpaying they're a small to medium they're paying for an enterprise prep package and it's the hardest conversation to have because your job is to justify their purchase when you don't believe in their purchase. So that's that's my hell. I am a really bad liar. Like I, I can't do it. I'm um Do, do you that's believe that's the mandate? Do you believe I, I, that you're supposed to lie if they're oversold? I don't think so. 
personally, I don't feel right doing that. I feel yeah. like getting them in a contract that's better. Like if our solution is going to solve for you at a lower level in a better way, I'd rather take the turn on that. I, I may be alone in that, but it doesn't set up for long-term success. And what it does set up for is a total churn of the account when they finally get fed up with paying for way too much and not accomplishing what they set out to accomplish. So it's it's like a rock in a hard place situation. And and that is my help. <laughs> Do you, so I'm, I, I will assume that this doesn't occur at, at DocuSign. It seems like it's a relatively mature organization. And so yeah. assume this occurs at a, at a younger company with Correct. less process, mm -hmm. what's the cure? Because I've seen this before and what I've seen work is, okay, we'll put a, a pretty big bonus on a salesperson's incentive plan for mm -hmm. renewals. Yeah. Okay. Is that, do you, do you feel like that's part of it? Is that a really big piece of it? What so you are you about? asking what's the tactical cure or what's the strategic cure so this doesn't happen again at the org well shit um that's a great <laughs> answer uh, strategic right it's scalable okay. cure not specific to any one instance i think you're right i think the uh ae needs to be tied to some kind of retention number that is that is the only solution that is the only way they'll sell the right thing because they'll have to go back and resell that thing in one to three years so in your typical SaaS model. So I think 100%, it comes back to if sales and customer success are aligned, this tends not to happen. So mm -hmm. that, that that's my solution <laughs> in a perfect world, right? What would your tactical answer have, have been? My tactical answer would have been, um, you may have to take a little turn to get the customer in a situation where they're going to be successful in the future. And that's a hard conversation to have. And hard to accept if you're, if you, you're always want to win, it's going to affect your comp. That's, that's some hard things to, to deal with, but the alternative is great. So we renewed one time, but then they're going to churn in three more years. Like that, that doesn't make sense to me. So um, ta tactically, you need to have a hard conversation with your customer and be like, this is what you actually use. This is what you don't need. And here's the problems we can actually solve if we get you in the right kind of contract. I don't think that's a hard, do you think that's a hard conversation? I think that with the customer, it's easy to say, Hey, yeah. look, I'm here advocating. For no, you. with the customer, you're right. You're yeah. right. It's, it's easier with the customer. It's hard to have it's hard with probably in internally. sales and <laughs> your business. Yeah. To justify churn is a difficult conversation, but. I respect that though. I, um, I think everybody feels that pain, right? I agree. Everybody at home is, is nodding their head vigorously. If you're a CSM that has some level of empathy, you definitely have felt that at some point, I feel like. I don't even think it's just empathy. I think it is the long-term play. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. It's yep. it's like uh, lying on your Tinder profile as a dude <laughs> yeah. saying you're 6'4 yeah. when you're really like 5'6". Like, yes. that's not a long-term play. Just can I Can I have a, I have a side note right here? I have a... Uh, my friend and I had a technique for Tinder. I met my husband on Tinder, by the way, mm -hmm. one of my best friends, Shannon, we'd switch phones and she swiped on him first, which he likes to remind me I swipe first. And I was like, actually, Shannon, swipe first. <laughs> uh, but he loves that. I would have too, but it's fine. <laughs> but the way, the way we could figure out with guys were actually taller than me, which doesn't always matter, but yeah. A lot of guys are intimidated by a tall woman, door frames, and mm. refrigerators. <laughs> and a lot of people have refriger refrigerators in one of their pictures. And if their head was above the refrigerator, we were probably, they were probably telling the truth. So just jog my memory. Thanks for that, that walk down memory lane, Don. <laughs> um, uh, let's wrap it up, Brittany. So the way I like to start this off is with your CS player of the week. So who out there in the customer success profession is uh, is moving it forward for you in the past seven days. Who do you want to give a shout out to? So this is a really hard question for me. There's so many people I want to shout out, but I'm a part of two different volunteer mentoring and coaching programs this mm. spring. And I want to shout out the people that are hosting those because 
the job market is so tough right now. And they've created this free resource for mentees to get linked to people that have experience in the industry. And it's just phenomenal. I'm so proud to be a part of both of these programs. So Maria Scobie Pillay um, created the Women in Customer Success Power Up Mentoring Program. Um, to help elevate women that are already in customer success or looking to break into it. And then, of course, Danny Liu and Daniel Garcia, another Catalyst shout out here mm. for their spring coaching cohort. Um, I'm having a wonder, wonderful conversations with both my um, coachee and my mentee, and I'm just so grateful to be a part of those. And I think both both programs deserve a huge shout out. Yeah, so this is where I say um, everything I said about Kevin, I want it to be said under the caveat of I totally respect everything they're doing. I am also a yeah. part of the, the coaching corner. <laughs> yes, um, I saw you on the intro meeting. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, I also, I really love that program too. And I am mentoring one individual and, and it's been an awesome conversation. And what I always find interesting right. about those, I imagine it's the same for the women in customer success, which uh, Maria has a fantastic podcast as well. So anybody yes. who... Um, needs more podcasts to listen to. Go find those <laughs> women in customer success. But um, what I think is so interesting about the coaching or mentoring stuff is n does not matter which side of the table you're sitting on. You're always mm -hmm. learning something. Exactly. You get always. what you put into it too. And that's mm -hmm. on both sides. Um, I'm so impressed when they come to the table and they're really prepared. But I think as a coach, you need to be prepared too. You need to have a strategy. And especially after that first session, that's kind of when you really go to work because I think what you need to do in that first session is share goals and really understand what they're looking to accomplish by partic mm -hmm. participating in this. Um, and I, I love the opportunity to help people achieve their goals. I think that's so much more gratifying than achieving your own. So, Yeah, I agree. Brittany, if you could take the audience members and point them in the direction of any one thing or activity, and it does not have to be customer success related, what would it be? Again, I am too. <laughs> Guess I like to break rules, apparently. We already talked about one a little bit. Um, I think the Challenger sale should be required reading. It's a book. Um, and the longer title is Taking Control of the Customer Conversation by Matthew Dixon and Matt Adamson. Um, it really changes your perspective on thinking about accounts strategically. So it's a great read, especially for high touch CSMs. Mm. And then one book I always point all of my personal mentees towards is Customer Success, How Innovative Companies Are Reducing Churn and Growing Recurring Revenue by Nick Mehta. Dan Steinman and Lincoln Murphy, some of the OGs. Um, I think this for me is the customer success Bible. And it is that because it is so foundational. It talks about the Salesforce story and where customer success came from in the first place and why companies put this model into place where sales can no longer handle that post-contract relationship. And I think it's really important to remember where you came from with where you're going. So I, I love that book to refer back to and, and keep a really grounded foundation on what is customer success and keep that in mind as we grow into something else. Yeah, it has a lot of great, I'd say like the 30,000 foot explanations of what customer success originally was, like you said, and mm -hmm. and what it was meant to do. Get out of the, right. the QBR and the uh, logging emails for whatever reason. And, and even like the pipeline, the, motion. Even yep. the pipeline stuff though, like that is... Mm -hmm. The pipeline stuff is apropos for where we sit today, right? Revenue is paramount, especially if you can do it at an efficient level of expense, which your existing customers are, of course, going to be more efficient forms of revenue. Mm -hmm. So, but that is a product of the moment. And ultimately, what customer success was built for was this idea of the subscription, right. the software as a service subscription model, mm -hmm. and the fact that you have to constantly be reselling. So if you just zoom out, and you think about customer success as the motion that is primarily responsible for the reselling of value constantly to a customer. It can be whatever the hell you want. And the book, I think, does a really good job of, of kind of like setting the stage for that and explaining how it was originally thought of. 
Yeah, 100%. And selfishly, um, that was required reading for me when I came to DocuSign from a leader I really, really admire. I no longer work for directly, but he's a bit of a mentor for me now. And it when I was coming from the startup environment and coming to this larger company, because to me, DocuSign's a really big company. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, <laughs> it really got me in the right mindset as to why, why our, why our group exists, why it's growing and what DocuSign needs from each individual CSM. So I'm really grateful that I got introduced to this title and that's why I, I put it in the hands of anyone I can. I think it's, it's a really good book. Those are two great suggestions. Brittany, where can folks connect with you? So you can absolutely find me on LinkedIn. Um, I do mentor uh, a very small amount of folks that are looking to break into customer success or separate themselves as customer success managers and get to the next level. Um, I have a link in my profile where you can figure, fill out a Google form to start that process. Or cool. um, I am that customer success gal on TikTok, which is literally so I can make videos to put on LinkedIn. <laughs> so those are probably your best. They're two great bets. videos. They're great videos. Oh, Anybody who's, who hasn't <laughs> already seen the videos, uh, get on it. <laughs> Thanks so much. Well, Brittany, thank you so much. It has been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you for, for sharing your knowledge and your insights with, uh, with the audience. Yes, you as well. And thank you so much for having me. And I'm still embarrassed that I didn't know who Lance Allen was at the beginning. Like I, I, I my Halloween community is like, oh my God, we don't know her right now. <laughs> You've been listening to Lifetime Value, the podcast for customer success professionals. If you like what you've heard, please rate our show and subscribe wherever you find your podcast. Please note that the views expressed in these conversations are attributed only to those individuals on this podcast and do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of their respective employers. For all inquiries, please reach out via email to dylan at lifetimevaluepodcast.com. Find us on YouTube via our channel, Lifetime Value, and find us on the socials at Lifetime Value Podcast. Until next time. If you get a chance, if you go on YouTube and you get to see his yard, he literally has just about every Home Depot animatronic they've ever come well, up with. Come it on, he has to. Amazing. Yeah. Well, he has true. To. does he have a really <laughs> probably big free yard when too? he designs it, right? <laughs> um, I think he moved recently, but it used to be fairly large. It has to be fairly large to house all those monsters, right? <laughs> I have to tell you, I am blown away f from the moment you recognized his name until just now when you somehow know that he recently moved <laughs> like how do you know so much about the senior director of holiday merchandise at home depot hey lifers this is Brittany casey that customer success gal and you're listening to lifetime value the customer success podcast oh the guns <laughs> at the end yes yes <laughs> I love it. I've been thinking about this one a lot, Dylan. So. <laughs> been rehearsing. I hope I did it justice. <laughs> wow. That was fantastic.